mistakes online on this Sunday, unprecedented times that we're living in, I'm going to call for unprecedented measures, and I am preaching to you today and uh, ministering to you, I hope, uh, across uh, the digital platforms that we have. And uh, we want to begin today, we have been having prayer meetings upon prayer meetings, as we should. And our church is a praying church, and we have regular scheduled prayer meetings, but we've moved everything online, plus we've ramped it up. And uh, last night, uh, about 160 people, I think, last I checked, uh, joined us for an online prayer meeting that uh, Kirk Moose and I are doing on Tuesday nights and Saturday nights at 7 o'clock. Tune in Facebook. Also, we'll have the link for Zoom, the video conferencing app we're using as well for those just times of encouragement and prayer uh, every Tuesday and Saturday night. Also, uh, Ms. Terry Thompson is uh, trying to work online with our academy, and she's doing a chapel every day uh, at 11 o'clock as well. And uh, Michelle Cohen is hosting many things on Facebook through her Facebook page. Uh, throughout the week so we have many opportunities to connect and I encourage you in these times that we're living in connect with your church Uh, I'm I'm spending a lot of time on the phone calling people checking on them but also through these online opportunities take advantage of them and uh, be a part of them we want to pray today and uh, just give glory to God for this day and then I'm going to get in the word with you and uh, preach to you a little bit and uh, for this time together on Sunday morning there is some uh, there are some folks here and uh, just uh, a few, a handful, that are helping us make this uh, happen. And also out in the parking lot, we've had drive through prayer today for people to drive through and, and, and be prayed for in a safe, six-foot, social distancing. Uh, but pray for you and your car. Take advantage. We're going to try to do those some more often as we're able to, and as long as it's in compliance with all that the health officials are asking us to do and all those things as well. So uh, God bless you on this day. I'm asking Amy, my wife, to lead us in a prayer time today. So let's pray together. Father, we do love you. And Lord, it is a joy to come and together in this place. And Lord, though we are separated from most of our uh, church family today, as we gather with those all over this nation who are doing the same thing and, and gathering in empty churches to spread your word. And Lord, so I pray for all those that are gathered in front of their computers and their phones and and listening to your word. God, I pray that they would feel the power of your spirit minister to them through these um, social media that we have today. And Lord, I just pray that you would you would speak a word of encouragement to your people. Lord, that you would give them a, a spirit uh, that would turn against the anxiety and the fear that is just gripping the hearts of people with so many unknowns today. And Lord, that you would put hope in your in your people this morning give us encouragement give us grace as we navigate through these times lord we look to you our eyes are upon you and we are expecting awesome things and it's in your most precious name we pray lord amen amen thank you amy for praying for us Uh, please join in to these uh, online prayer opportunities that we have and uh, take advantage of them let me remind you of one other thing quickly before we get into the word this morning uh, and that is that uh, we are uh, already in our fellowship and I know every fellowship is experiencing this around the nation but having people that are losing their job and uh, are facing some very uh, uh, big uncertainty in their ec- in economic terms and so we've started an Acts 2 fund to give I'm really encouraging you if you want to give to that it goes just directly to people that are hurting during this time uh, in, in the body of believers. And I encourage you to go on to online giving on trophylakes.org. Don't, don't forget uh, to remember your church during these times so we can uh, continue to pay our bills and continue to keep things going until we can be re- reunited in person. And I'm looking forward to shaking your hands soon and hugging you even and telling you that I love you in person. And so we look forward to that. Until that day, we're going to continue to minister to one another and uh, be strong in our faith, believe in what God uh, is doing in the world today. I want you, if you have your Bible today and uh, there in your house, uh, if you'd take some time to really focus right now, uh, just pretend you're in the building today. And so you're not uh, getting distracted with other things that are going on, but you're really going to uh, embrace this and, and uh, on your online Bible or, or through your uh, leather bound Bible, whatever it may be. I want you to look at Psalm 46 uh, today, and that's the main place that we're going to go through and several verses are going to be there. 
uh, for us to, to look at. Uh, but I'm going to read another verse, uh, that, that, and I'll, I'll tie it together as, as we get started here. But uh, you go ahead and stay at Psalm 46. But I'm going to read from the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2 and 3, listen to what he says. Paul speaks of his love for the people there at Corinth, that many had come to Christ under his ministry. And he says, for I am jealous for you. I, I want uh, an exclusive relationship for you. With godly jealousy, he said, I'm jealous. For I have betrothed you. I have promised you. I have brought you together to, uh, to one husband. And he's speaking in marriage terms here to speak of the relationship uh, with the Lord. And he said, the reason I'm jealous for you with this godly jealousy is that I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, he says in verse 3, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I want you to think about that. We'll come back to some thoughts from that. But then in Psalm 47, I want to do something I, I, I don't know that I've ever done before, but uh, not just read the psalm, in Psalm 46, I think I said Psalm 47, Psalm 46, read the superscription. You know what that is? That's where the title of the psalm is, but underneath it, it tells a little bit of the setting of that particular psalm. And in this psalm, Psalm 46, the psalms are the ancient hymn book of the, uh, of the church, it says this, this is to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamot. Now what does that mean? Well, most uh, uh, scholars believe that that Alamot means a, a, a word that would refer to a musical notation, kind of a, a, a treble word, a word to speak of the sopranos that would sing. Uh, but yet, really in its basic form, the word Alma that it is derived from here means virgin. Same word used in Isaiah when the prophet Isaiah foretold of a day that was coming when a virgin will conceive and have a child. So here you have a whole psalm that is written to people that uh, if you use that term in that way, to people that are pure, you know, innocent, uninvolved of worldly things, people that are inexperienced, you know, people that are fresh and new is what he's speaking to. Now think about what he said, Paul said, over in 2 Corinthians, I want to present you as a chaste virgin uh, to Christ. I, I want you to go back and experience an innocent time. Paul said, I fear that you're going to walk away from that simplicity. And it's, it's very important what we say with that because, you know, what happens is the longer we live in our relationship with God, the more uh, apt we are to get accumulation of things and forget the first love of that moment when we just had Christ, just were saved, when all things were new. Uh, my world was rocked when I, this past year when I, Bishop Tony Miller said these words. He said, when, when, what would things be like if you didn't know everything? What would things be like if you didn't know everything? And I thought about that. You know, when I came to Christ, it was me and Jesus. I didn't understand anything. I didn't know how to open my Bible. I, didn't, I, didn't, I had such a, a lack of knowledge about theology. My first Bible study that I went to, they were doing a Bible study on John 3. That's where uh, Jesus talks to Nicodemus and tells him he must be born again. And so I just raised my hand in the Bible study and I said, when did Jesus get born again? And they all looked at me like, you dummy, Jesus didn't have to get born again. He had never seen it. I didn't know all the details. It was just me and Jesus. That always reminds me, you don't have to pa pass a test to become a Christian and a believer in Jesus. God saved me in that, that fresh new experience. But over time, you get burdened down with all the theological details. And you get burdened down with all kinds of this or that. And, 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 and people get divided over all these details in the body of Christ. And Paul said, I want you to never forget what it was like when you came to Christ as a new way. And so when we come to Psalm 46, we see that same pattern in this psalm that I'm going to uh, give to you today. I want to ask a question today. Here's the question. How does a follower of Jesus Christ face this global virus? that is upon us. How does a follower of Jesus Christ face this global virus and the challenges that 
go with it. You know, when I first asked that question and wrote it down as a title, I want to just preach a little bit before I preach and say, I, I, bless God, I'll tell you what we do around my house. I'm putting oil on the door. I'm declaring no pestilence shall come unto me, as Psalm 91 says, and no plague shall come into your house. I'm praying that the virus, if it somehow gets on my hand because I've touched some surface out in the community, but when I cross over the threshold into my home, I pray that virus dies on the spot. And I can be free of that, but that's not what I'm preaching on today. I just want to add that in there. I'm preaching about how you face the test of what is going on. People are so anxious and are making crazy decisions. How should a follower of Jesus face this, and how should it be different when we look at it that way? I'm going to give you a couple things out of Psalm 46. We're just going to kind of go through them. I've got five in number. I'll, I'll move through them quickly here today. The first one I would come to is this. You know, this innocent faith or the faith of a follower of Christ understands something called trust. They understand something called trust. The way you face as a follower of Jesus these global crises or any test is different because you have a foundation of understanding what trust is all about. Look what the psalmist says. Something bad was going on when he wrote this. Because you see, he talks about a very present help in time of trouble. Great trouble was going on. He goes on to say that even if the earth be removed, what? He's talking about uh, the earth going shifting under your feet. If you've ever been in an earthquake, you know how terrifying that can be when what you feel is always so certain is heaving and swelling under your very feet. But he also says not only uh, the earth be removed, but mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. I live in Trophy Club, Texas. We don't have mountains out here, but I grew up in East Tennessee, and we had huge mountain, mountains there, and I can't even imagine a day where, like, Lookout Mountain, well, a beautiful mountain in my hometown would just be gone because it's always been there. It's, a, it, it's stationary, but he's talking about things that have always been there that are now being moved and shifted. He goes on to talk about you know, these mountains being thrust into the sea, and the waters are roaring and they're troubled, they're foaming, they're in turmoil, the waters are. All of these things are happening, but in the midst of all of that, he says, God is our refuge and strength. He declares that. What makes a follower of Jesus different is that we know of a refuge and strength that we have in times when things that have been so solid and stationary in our life are beginning to move and change around us. When, when, when we're trying to hold it together, when, when life is pulling you apart, when we're in those situations, we're different because we understand this trust issue. Our God is a refuge and a strength. Now that word refuge that is used there is used of a person, a person that you look for. In a, for assistance and help during these times of need. And we know who that person is. Our God is faithful to give us uh, strength every day of our life, to walk in that strength, to experience that strength in, in our life. That, that word strength always is a, is a physical and mental strength that he gives to us. So what do we do? As followers of Christ, we face every test, and we choose trust in that situation because our God is a refuge. When I was growing up, my dad was a big man, 6'4", uh, 6'5", six, six, big man. And uh, I don't know what happened to me, but uh, I didn't get it. But he was a big man, and when he, was, he was big in life, too. And dad would come home sometimes. He was such a fun dad. And he'd, 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 he'd come in on Friday from work and uh, pull up in his, in his Mustang. He had a 66 Mustang, and you could hear it as he was uh, downshifting on the way to the house through the ridge that we lived on. And he'd pull in the driveway and say, boys, put the tents in the car. We're going camping this weekend. And we'd run to the garage and pull out our pup tents and throw in some water and some little Debbies. And here we went off to spend the night out somewhere camping together. You know, not one time when my dad came to us and said, let's go camping or let's go on a trip or whatever. I never, w I never looked at my dad at five, six, seven years old and said, dad, is there enough gas in the car for us to get there? I'm not sure. Now, Dad, can we afford to do this? You know, is this in our monthly budget? Do we have the finances to buy? I never said that. Why? Because if Dad was going, Dad was taking care of all the details. All I had to do was enjoy the ride. 
Can I tell you something? As believers, we have a relationship with our Abba Father who takes care of his own and provides for them and everything, so we crawl into his arms as a place of refuge in times of difficulty. So we do, we face it differently because we understand this trust issue. But also this innocent faith, the faith of a follower of Christ, understands courage as well. It's interesting the statement of faith that is made in verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear. We choose courage over cowardice and fear. Now, I want to explain that just a little bit because let's, let's make sure we understand what we're talking about here. Just the fact that we choose faith and choose to act in courage does not mean that fear is not around us. It's the choices that we make. Listen, I, 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 I'm facing this just like all of you are facing it and others are facing it. I, I don't know. I, I begin to look two, three weeks, a month down the road and say, what are we going to do? Our, our academy is, uh, you know, dependent upon tuition and we have teachers that expect, you know, to be paid and we're, we're working through these things and the, and the church itself, we have bills to pay and, and, you know, you can get caught up and start thinking like that. And it, but here's what you do. Here's what you do. You don't deny that there's fearful situations around you, but you choose not to act upon it out of fear. You choose to work out of a trust and a confidence, and you take steps of great courage that are not based upon what you feel or what you see. It, it's, you're not governed by fear. You're not acting out of fear. You're not making decisions out of fear. There may be fearful things around you, but your choices, your direction in life is based upon faith and trust in God. And it takes some good old-fashioned courage to stand up to that. I believe one thing that believers need to hear me, and hear me well. You know, in this time where there's so much fear and anxiety, it is an opportunity for followers of Christ to say, yes, we do not deny the fear that is there, but we choose to operate in our lives with a courage that says, I believe God's going to take care of me. He's always taking care of me. He's going to continue to take care of me. And we walk through that. It's amazing to me how Christians fall apart sometimes worse than people that don't even know God. And I, I, I get uh, overwhelmed sometimes seeing that. Now, folks, I, I believe, uh, listen, I'm not saying try to act stupid, you know, and just call it faith and act stupid. There's a fine line between stupid and, and courage and faith. And, and we're not foolish, you know. I'm washing my hands. I'm doing what people say. But, but let me tell you something. Don't ever let that common sense of obeying what the experts are telling us, don't ever let that common sense become a, a haven, a, a refuge for fear and unbelief. Some people will say, well, I'm just doing what they say, but yet they're not expressing any faith whatsoever. They're using that as a cloak to just fall in line and fall apart like everybody else is doing. I'm, I'm not going to hide in that. I'm going to have common sense, but I'm not going to let my common sense rob me of the faith and the courage that is needed in difficult times. Courage says, you know, I will not fear. We will not fear. Therefore, he says, I will no, not fear. We will not fear what is going on in this situation. I love what Bill Johnson says. He said, what if fear threw a party and nobody showed up? Oh, hallelujah. What if fear threw a party and nobody showed up? I, I'm encouraged, you know, to, to even in the midst of anxieties and, and tough decisions down the road to say I'm not going to operate. I'm not going to let my life be governed by that. I got to remind you of something, folks. Uh, God cannot be courageous for you. You have to be courageous. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but you've got to take the steps. You've got to rise up and make decisions. Declare it. Listen, God says these things about your house and about protecting you. But listen, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. So you need to rise up and agree with the truth that is there and proclaim it over your life, proclaim it over your children, proclaim it over your family, proclaim it over your business, proclaim it over your church, proclaim it over your community. I agree with God. It shall not come here. It shall not disrupt here. Stand in some courage and step out on God's word and do those things. You know, it's easy to be courageous when you don't have anything. That's what Paul said. When you start out, it's easy. Amy and I started out in life, and just a few months after we were married, we put everything we owned 
into a glorified uh, van called a Jartran rental and drove to New Orleans, Louisiana from Tennessee to Ten Seminary. Everybody said, you're so courageous. Wow, to just go to that city, that big city you've never lived in, newlyweds. You don't have a lot of money. You're so courageous. No, I wasn't. I had nothing to lose. I mean, if the truck burned down, all they were going to be was ashes of used furniture that didn't match and, you know, some old clothes in there. I didn't have, but as time goes on and you have children and you experience that, you accumulate more and more and more. Amen? Same thing in our believers, our Christian life. We, we, we start out, it's easy to be fearless. What do we got to lose? I stood before a church one time that had called me to be their pastor. And I mean, they were, they were, there was a group that absolutely was mean as a snake. I'm telling you, you want to find the, the best people in the world, go to church. But you can find some meanest people in church as well, too. And they were harassing my family. They were calling in the middle of the night, leaving meds, trying everything in the world to run me off. And I told Amy, I said, get the car running. I'm preaching tonight. And I got up, named names, called the baby by its name, told the people, pointed them out, said what they've done. You've run every preacher off ever in the history of this church. I'm telling you now, you're not going to run this one off. And if you do, praise God, I'll be released to go start something somewhere else. And you know what? The men rallied and said, finally, somebody's standing up to this crowd. And after that, revival broke out. It just takes a little simple courage, God, to step out on his word and to do what he's called us to do quickly. Number three, innocent faith or the faith of a follower of Christ understands the importance of the Holy Spirit in our life. You say, where are you getting that? Look what he says as verse 4 starts. I mean, we got trouble. We got the earth being removed. We got mountains being hurled into the sea. We got waters foaming and turmoil. And then verse 4, the whole tone changes. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. You go from turmoil to peace. And what's he talking about here? A river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Wow, what, what, what is this river? I'll just to give you the answer right now. The river is the presence of God through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what the river is. That's what we always know the river is about. Think about the great cities of our world and the rivers they have. You know, London has the Thames. Paris has the La Seine. Uh, Washington, D.C. has the Potomac. Dallas here has the Trinity River. I grew up in Chattanooga. We had the Tennessee River. But Jerusalem has no river. The great city of God. And there's no great river flowing through it or beside it. But underneath it, there is a spring. It's called the Gihon Spring. It is a spring that when they built walls around the city and other people would come and lay siege to their city, they might go hungry eventually, but they always had water coming up. You know how much? 600,000 cubic meters of water every year come up through that. It, it comes from the Gihon, comes from the word uh, Giha, which means gushing forth. They had like, a, like I would say an artesian well pumping up in that city, supplying them with their water. What a beautiful picture of the people of God and the supply God gives us in the Holy Spirit. By the way, this Gihon spring was also known as the fountain of the virgin. And it comes from some tale that probably was made up, but that, that Mary washed uh, Jesus' swaddling clothes in that, in that spring. But either way, it's still called that. Many people still referred to it that way. It flowed into the pool of Siloam so that they would have a reservoir to meet the people's needs throughout the year. Now think about this. Jesus comes along, and what does Jesus say? John 7, 37, on the last day, the day of the great feast, Jesus stood up in the midst, and it was like he couldn't contain himself. And with a loud voice, he said to the people, He who believes in me, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those uh, believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus has been glorified and the Holy Spirit has been given to the church. And so we have a reservoir in our very lives. We have a reservoir in our fellowship that comes not from the outside but comes from God himself in us. Look at this. A never failing fountain of unfathomable reservoir of joy, strength, and peace forevermore. 
We sing some strange praise songs around here sometimes. You know this praise song we sing? Deep cries out. What does that mean? Well, it means what you understand it to mean now looking at the scripture. I've got a river of living water, a fountain that'll never run dry. It's an open heaven you're releasing and we will never be denied because we're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're going to dance in the river. We're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're going to jump in the river. Deep cries out, deep cries out to you. What a what a great song when you understand the power of the Holy Spirit that we have in us, that flows in us through that. Mary, the virgin, the most famous one that came to God with that precious, innocent faith, said, you're going to have a, a baby. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? When God got ready to do the greatest thing he was ever going to do, he didn't go to the intelligentsia of his day. He did not go to the rabbis of his day. He didn't go to Jerusalem Theological Seminary and say, give me your best candidates. He went to the country. And unlike the United States of America, the country was north. And in north in Galilee, he found in a little bitty village called Nazareth a very precious, sweet teenage girl. Some believe not more than 14 years old. And an angel appears to her in prayer time and says, fear not. You are special. Something great's going to happen to you. You're going to give forth of a child. She said, how can that be? I have not known a man. And he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. God comes to those in that innocent faith and displays himself and reveals himself. You know, I, I, this is a real struggle to me. I'm, I'm watching my time here. This is a real struggle to me because so many in the church, so many in the church are bound by a tradition that worships an unholy trinity today. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm telling you what they worship. I see it everywhere. They worship a trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. But that's not the trinity. That's an unbiblical trinity but that's what, they, that's what they worship. If you look at the deeds and the sayings, no one ever talks about the Holy Spirit. Billy Graham said it so famously, take the Holy Spirit out of most churches and they would never know the difference. My, oh my, may it never be said of us. I want you to understand something. I believe in this book. I know it's supernatural revelation from God. I wrote it down. I believe it's infallible, inspired, and not just inspired, but verbal, plenary inspired. That means the very words are inspired. The truth with no mixture of evil. Uh, it's inerrant. And any other adjectives you want to come up, I'll sign on to. I believe that about God's rock of revelation and the supernaturally revealed Word of God. It didn't come down out of gold plates from heaven. It arose from human experience of people just like us, but God inspired it when it was written down, and it becomes a perfect record of revelation for us today. But I'm going to tell you something, remind you of this. Listen, in these difficult times, hear what I'm saying. In these difficult times, the first 400 years of the church's history, they didn't have a Bible. Wow, and most will agree that the church was most powerful in the first 400 years that it existed. Wow, it took over the whole known world in those 400 years. You say, yeah, but then the, the letters all come together and, they, and they, they put it all together in a canon and then they had the word. Yeah, they did, but nobody could read it. Only the preachers could read it. Only the ones that were uh, trained in the languages and they kept it in a language that, as the years progressed that other people didn't know. So it was 1,500 before some very courageous men like John Wycliffe and others said, we're going to translate the Bible, not in the tongue of the scholars, but in the tongue of the people that, are, that can read it and understand it. And when they started doing that, a reformation took place. And out of that reformation, people could read the Bible for themselves, and a renaissance exploded with new art, new music, new architecture, all of that, all because the Word of God was released. But think about that, 1,500 years, they didn't even have a Bible. They couldn't even read it. And the church seemed to make it. Why? Because they were spirit-dependent, not Holy Bible-dependent. You understand what I'm saying? I, I can't, I, I, listen, the church has to be more spirit-centered than Bible-centered. And there's not a contradiction between those two at all, but there has to be a dependency upon the Holy Spirit. We've got to get back to the streams that is re are released in us because God speaks to us through that. And we can know that truth all those years, 1,500 years. You know what they had? They had the Apostles' Creed. 
that everybody was taught to recite. And it gave the doctrine and the purpose and the details of what you needed to do in a, in a small paragraph. And everybody learned that. And that was enough Bible for them to be able to change worlds and change cities and do things. And today we have all the revelation of God. And I respect it. I, I, I believe in it. I treasure it. But I want you to know the Holy Spirit is in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in our life. Listen, you need to download the antivirus software into your life today. And you know what that is? The Holy Spirit. Download the antivirus software into your spirit today. It is the Holy Spirit. He comes within us and he lives within us. God Almighty takes residence in our life and he walks with us and he speaks to us and he convicts us and he opens our mind and our heart to revelation from the Holy Scriptures and we hear his voice in our life. Quickly, I'll give you the last two. Number four, if you're going to be different and a believer should be different in facing this, we're also different because we understand the power of his voice. Boy, I could preach on this. The nations rage, verse 6. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. You notice it didn't say his word, his voice. Your voice is what you have to say. God is not dead, amen? If he's alive, he's still talking. He still has his things to say. Obviously, he's not going to contradict. There's no shadow of turning with him. He's not going to contradict what he's already revealed, but he still has a now word to speak to our hearts and our souls, and we do well to listen to that. Finally, the last thing I would come to is in verse 10. This faith, uh, this faith it understands, I don't have a good word here. I would say understands surrender or understands rest or understands relaxing. What in the world? In the middle of mountains falling apart and hurled into the sea and, and waters roaring and troubled and all this trouble that is there. Look what he says to us in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Whoa, you know what the little translation of that is? Let your hands, I've got a microphone in my hand. I can't put both of them down. But let your hands just come to your side. That's what it means. Put your hands. You know, we're busy with our hands, aren't we? You know, how many times you've been in situations, I'm just throwing my hands up. I don't know what to do. Or I'm washing my hands of that situation. That has a whole new meaning in our world today. Washing my hands of that like Pontius Pilate tried to do with Jesus. We'll get up sometimes and say, well, the situation's out of hand. Or... Some of you people are recognizing uh, you've got your kids home all week for two weeks, three weeks straight now. All the ones you found out something, didn't you? It wasn't the teacher's problem after all, all along. <laughs> Little Johnny wasn't that perfect all along, you know. You're finding out at home, he, he, he's the problem. He's got some behavior issues here. But you know what we do in that? We say he or she is a handful. Man, that's a handful. We're busy with our hands, but he said there comes a time to just relax them. And let them just hang by your side. Wow, just, just relax in his presence. Be still and know that I am God. I heard a preacher this week say, I'm really struggling. And somebody said, why are you struggling so much in this? He said, because I, I've just not been able to communicate with my sermon preparation team to get ready for Sunday. Somebody said, sermon preparation team? He said, yeah, you know the ones that do all the props and get the lights and smoke machines and all those things working. This man didn't know how to preach with all those things not with him. I want to tell you, I love technology. Thank God for it right now. I love do proper lighting. I want to be excellent in everything that I do. But I'm going to tell you, if it gets worse and worse, meet at my house out by the old oak tree because I'm going to take the word of God and just stand there and preach. And we're going to take communion together. And we're going to sing together. And we're going to love on one another. We don't have to have all this stuff to have church. God's reminding us in these days. It's not about that stuff. It's about me and the river, the stream that flows in the midst of you. That's why we face it different. Because he lives within us. Well, when's he going to come? You know, the Christ follower understands this trust and courage. And the Holy Spirit and the voice of God and our, our surrender, our rest, our peace. But when's he going to come? When's God going to show up in all this mess? Uh, he says it right here. He said when he comes, the end of
and the dawn. You say, well, does that mean that God's going to come at 6.30 in the morning? No, no, no. Understand something here. You know, he's not going to come at the dawn. When he does come, it will be dawn. And dawn signifies a new season. Listen, church, we're going to be different and changed as we go forward. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. Things are going to be different. I don't know everything, but I know God's going to teach us some things. And it's going to be a new season. And when God shows up, it's going to be dawn. It's going to be a time of a new day, a new experience, a new power with him. You know, they had four watches of the night in ancient Israel. The first watch was from about 6 o'clock or sundown to 9 p.m. And then from 9 p.m. to midnight was the second watch. And then the third watch was midnight to 3 a.m. But the fourth watch, that was the hardest one, 3 a.m. to dawn. Wow, that's when it got darkest. That's when you get most tired. I can't, I can't tell you the times back in my history of pastoring that I came up with some brilliant ideas of having all-night prayer meetings. Man, everybody signed up. Let's have an all-night prayer meeting. We were praising God at 6 o'clock. We were praising God at 9 o'clock in the evening. At midnight, a few people went home. By 3 o'clock, there was about me and the staff standing there trying to stay awake and praise God till the dawn because it gets harder as it goes along and it gets darker right before the dawn. But here, my friend, hang on. Hang on. He shall help her just at the break of dawn. Have encouragement today. Have strength. Have, have, know your God's a refuge. Exercise this courage because God's coming right on time. He won't be late. He won't be early. He'll be right on time when he shows up. I want you to pray with me today uh, as we come to the end of this time together. Father, I pray for all of those that are listening today. I pray, God, you'd encourage their hearts with this. Lord, help us as believers, as followers of Jesus to to be different as you command us, as you instruct us, as you show us in the scriptures. Let us give not into fear, but to embrace courage and faith in these times. Let us stay strong and solid in what we believe and knowing that you're going to take care of your own as you have promised to do. Lord, we love you today. I pray for everyone that is listening to this live and everyone that will listen to this later. May God, you bless their homes. May you bless their lives. I pray no disease, no sickness, no plague will come into their houses. But I pray that you would surround your, their houses, uh, Lord, with the protection that comes uh, uh, from you. Lord, we agree with your scripture and speak it over our lives and over our families, our homes, our church, our business, our community. We, we pray these things. And Lord, I pray for these folks today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being in touch with us here today. Be clinging at trophylakes.org. That's my email address. Please write me. Tell me something. Tell me that you watched today. Let me hear from you. There's an opportunity to comment on the Facebook uh, stream as well. Let us know that you're out there and how you're doing. And if you need anything, please call us. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next on Tuesday night for a time of prayer at 7, Saturday night for a time of prayer at 7, and the Lord willing next week right here at the Church of Trophy Lakes. God bless you.